Now there are many ways to build a watch collection. And I know this might be a scary thought for some of you that are watching this, but having only one watch is viable for many people out there. Now, whether or not you're gonna actually do that is a very different story. I know I probably could not do that even if I tried my very hardest to break things down to one watch. But what we're gonna be doing is going in that theme today and really trying to pinpoint some of the most versatile, the most versatile watches on the entire market. Now this is obviously going to be slightly subjective, but here are some points of criteria as I'm going through this uh, that we're going to follow throughout the video. For one, strap and bracelet doesn't necessarily need to be viable on both of those options, but having some possibility to both is going to help our case. 50 meters of water resistance is going to be the minimum requirement, but 100 meters of water resistance would be ideal. My classification for versatile here is not looking for one individual use case, more looking at the collective market. Think of all the different types of scenarios somebody might have when wearing a watch and thinking from that swimsuit, maybe more in the aquatic environment, all the way to a suit. Could it work in all those different scenarios? There will be some slight leniency in certain areas on those extremes, but that's kind of the general criteria. And what I'm looking at here is versatility as a concept for the broader sum of us as a collective group of enthusiasts, not for one individual. So there could be a watch that's not on here that quite frankly is more versatile for you than it is maybe for another person. So again, just putting this all out here, this is just one opinion on the internet. I'm just one guy. So if you disagree, I totally understand, but I'm trying to just pinpoint some of these most versatile watches for the largest amount of people possible. And one other point that I'll mention is because this is more of a comprehensive concept where we're gonna be going through a longer list of watches, I do want to make this more focused around mainstream brands, larger brands, and not getting into micros just because I do think that will start to go off on the deep end in terms of making this list way too exhaustive. One of the most polarizing words and topics in watches is determining icon status. In one of our latest articles, our head of editorial, Mark Bernardo, lists out 28 of the most iconic watches of all time. It makes a case for each one of them in belonging on the list. Check out the link in the description down below to give it a read and leave a comment on the article if you disagree with any of its choices. It's definitely a fun topic to dig into and discuss. Check it out in the description down below. So my goal here is to look at many different price ranges. And to start us off, I wanna look at the Seiko SRPE 5153, this collection of watches commonly known as the Dress KX. Now the dial color is going to strongly dictate which one of these is going to be the most versatile. I would obviously go for something a little bit more uh, straightforward in terms of the dial color, but these are watches that are amazing for just being a kind of dumb reach. Like you just wanna turn your brain off, don't have to worry about what you're going to be wearing with this watch. It's going to work in most scenarios. 40 millimeter case diameter, 44.6 millimeter lug to lug and 11.5 millimeters in thickness, 100 meters of water resistance, so very suitable there. Standard 4R36 on the inside and mineral glass on top. Some might push back on the mineral glass and maybe getting some sapphire here might be even more viable, but this is a watch that probably leans slightly more sporty, but still, if you pick a more muted color for that dial, one of these variants, I think that is going to work in so many different scenarios. These are just one of these watches that, despite there being a lot of competition in this price range, these are staples at this sub $300 tier. And if you're getting into Seiko, maybe looking for your first mechanical watch, these are very easy ones to go with. And quite frankly, if you were satisfied with it, you probably wouldn't need another one after it. Another watch from Japan I wanna mention here is going to be the Orient Commuter. So the Commuter is not a watch that gets as much hype compared to some other Orient models, but when it comes to split splitting the gap of dress as well as more sport orientation, this is a watch that I would quickly recommend. Now the Maestro was a model that I would mention quite frequently just because of the 100 meters of water resistance and its middle ground of that kind of dressy concept that still could be probably dressed down to a fine degree. Orient seems to be moving away from those models, which I think is a bit of a shame. Uh, we'll see if they decide to change their tune on that, but I'm gonna look at the commuter here. This is by the theme of the name being a watch that is suited for that kind of everyday style environment. Something you could wear going to work, something you could wear elsewhere, maybe in a more casual attire, viable both on its bracelet as well as on a strap. The bracelet, not the greatest, uh, so that's something to consider. And only 50 meters of water resistance and a little bit larger on that case, but very straightforward, not going to be clashing with any attire. And as you're gonna notice with this pick, not mentioning the Kamasu, Mako, which are of course very suitable options, as well as the Bambino, but I do wanna stay right in that middle ground and also kind of veer away from the diver style just because when you're looking at that more extreme end of things with dress attire, sometimes it can clash. 
Now in this next category is going to be looking at two field oriented watches from Seiko, more to the price tier around $700. And these are going to be Alpinus models. I do not wanna look at the Alpinus SPB121, which is essentially the successor to the Saab 017 just because the additional crown on that watch, also its position, creates a bit of a different type of silhouette, which I think is going to clash with some different environments. And the compass bezel creates a bit of a different look. I'm looking at more of the SPB243 in that collection and the SPB155. I find these to be a little bit more in that sweet spot uh, in the middle of the range of versatility. Again, dial color is gonna be a strong consideration here for both of these models, but the theme here remains essentially the same. Incredibly robust watches with 200 meters of water resistance are going to wear pretty compact for their size. They're both around that 38 millimeter case size. Thickness is going to mirror each other quite evenly. And then getting the 6R35 movement on the inside with that 70 hour power reserve. Another theme throughout this video, and I want to address it right here because I think this will be the first point where we are going to have to talk about it integrated steel sports watches. I'm actually going to slightly move away from those watches in this list. Now, there are going to be some that are going to be included but I will give reason why I think those might deserve the nod compared to others, uh, given their approach. Now, the concept of a TSO, what is the most popular TSO at the moment? It seems to be the PRX, but I would argue the more versatile watch is the Gentleman, because I believe you're still getting some sporty upside, 100 meters of water resistance, sapphire crystal, but in the process, getting a watch that's easier to dress down while being more viable for different strap options on the market. You are a bit more limited with that integrated style design. Now with the Gentleman, one of the most interesting things for me about this watch is it's crazy how it has almost become underrated as a byproduct of the PRX. This watch is, when you're talking about $1,000 to spend, maybe a little bit less, what can I get best Swiss watch for the money that can do kind of it all? This would be in the running for me. Now the bracelet is the only area where I would say it lags behind both even Tissot standard. It's not a bad bracelet, but it's not quite to the level of the head of the PRX, actually not quite close to that. I think that bracelet is much better. But apart from that, everything else down the board is rock solid. 40 millimeter case, I might say it wears slightly larger than that, not too much larger, but relatively true to size, kind of in that ballpark, but not going to wear smaller. 11.5 millimeters in thickness. And on the inside, you're getting the automatic C07.811. The dot one 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 is in the PRX, so you're getting a higher standard for this movement, and it's also coming with a silicon balance spring on the inside, which will help with the uh, defense against magnetism and shock, which is a nice little added feature that I don't think enough people consider. And another point I mention all the time when talking about this watch, the faceting on those applied indices is beautiful to look at. That's that one element of this watch that really pops. Even though the dial backdrop is pretty straightforward in its approach, the style still has a uh, ability to pop off when you are looking at it. So now we have to look at one Hamilton watch. And I was struggling because you have to look at probably the khaki field collection. I did consider the Jazz Master Performer, which is a new model from the brand. Uh, that one absolutely deserves to be in the running, but I'm gonna look at one Hamilton khaki field model specifically, and that is the Murph. The Murph to me feels like the most rounded out package when you're talking about versatility. Some of the mechanical options, amazing watches. I think they're phenomenal. The automatics as well go along with it, but those do feel overly casual in comparison to the Murph. And the Murph is able to feel elevated depending on the strap a little bit more to me. I think it's just the use of the cathedral handset. It's a bit more traditional and romantic in its approach while not deviating too far from the pack that it just strips bare the concept that I think makes the khaki field so versatile. 80 hour power reserve movement, 38 millimeters with the case size, as well as getting the original 42 millimeter option. So you are getting some different choices here, depending on your wrist size, which I think is great. These watches do wear more compact. So at least for the case diameter to the lug to lug ratio, I think is a bit better compared to some of the other khaki field models. And you're still getting hundred meters of water resistance with the cathedral hands, the tie-ins to interstellar is like a little add on bonus. It's not gonna of course be any factor in our consideration for this, but it is interesting to include. But I think that creates a watch that is probably the most versatile that Hamilton makes. Now we shift over to really similar idea, but now we're jumping up to Oris. And here I'm looking at the Oris Big Crown Pointer Date. This is a model family I absolutely love. Probably my favorite from Oris's entire collection. It comes from a collection from 1938. And it really delivers on that charm of maintaining the past while continuing to push forward. 
with some of the combinations of things you're seeing. Cathedral handset, very romantic, very classic. Also the pointer date complication is something you very seldom see in this price range and really don't see very often in watches in general. And then in addition to that, the coin edge bezel and the use of different materials for the cases, I would say the classic approach here would be looking at something from the Servo Volante line, uh, maybe in that blue, or if you're looking at something in black, they do have some crazier colors like burgundy, green, but I would think something like black would be the most versatile of this entire collection. You do have a few different case sizes to choose from, a 40 millimeter, 36 millimeter, as well as those 38 millimeter options to go with, and pretty reasonable lug to lug dimension across all those models. One of the downsides I'll mention for this kind of versatility aspect is 50 meters of water resistance. So it just kind of depends where you're at. If I'm thinking about the wide, vast majority of people, this would be probably a consideration though. Okay, here we have a new watch and I wanted to give the nod to this one in comparison to the Spirit because the Longines Spirit, it is incredibly versatile. I think it's arguably the best do-it-all everyday watch for around $2,500. But Longines just unveiled a updated Conquest that I think deserves a mention and some love here. So if you're not familiar, the previous Conquest models that had that crazy water resistance and really large crown guard, which I think was creating a bit of a issue when it came to the watches being so versatile, but then you have this large protruding crown on the three o'clock side that kind of works against the versatility of the watch itself. These refine them out, thin out the bracelet, improve it, also way improved dial finish in the process, and an array of colors that will be more all-encompassing in terms of accommodating more people. Now the watches now are 41 millimeters, but uh, getting a reasonable lug to lug, 10.9 millimeters of thickness, and the L888 caliber on the inside, 70 hour power reserve movement, all while coming under $2,000. This is now getting in that range where you're maybe making an argument for the best do-it-all watch for $2,000, in my opinion, because let's look at the competition. I mean, you can mention something like the Tudor 1926. The Tudor Black Bay collection continues to go a little bit higher up market. You look at something like a Zen 556, which is, of course, deserves to be in this uh, realm. The Oris Big Crown Pointer Date, as we mentioned, is also in here and some of the other Big Crown models. But you're getting a 70 hour power reserve and a watch that just looks the part, finishing on the bracelet, the case, the dial, much more refined compared to the previous version. You are paying a bit more of a premium, but I think these are gonna do exceptionally well. And I think Longines did a phenomenal job in just elevating the feel of this collection. Now I just mentioned this watch and I was on the fence, all right, which one should you consider? The Black Bay 36 or those other Black Bay non-diver models, which again, that's a whole other subject for the uh, long winded way of describing these things. Or you look at the Tudor Ranger. I decided on the Tudor Black Bay 36 because I think it just has a little bit more elevated feel. Uh, you're also getting the MT calibers. And I think many people that are looking in Tudor's direction probably want some Black Bay affiliation if they've never delved into the brand any further. So you have a variety of different options here. I think the model that people talk about the most and affiliate with this collection is going to be the 36 millimeter option, uh, 10.5 millimeters in thickness, very wearable lug to lug of 44 millimeters and water resistance of 100 meters. Now new for 2023, these models are also going to get some MT manufacturer calibers on the inside, 70 plus hour power reserve, COSC certified movements. And I would say now this collection has really been rounded out. Like there was a head scratcher for me for quite some time why Tudor did not do this, add the MT calibers and really look at this collection because these were fan favorites from the very beginning when they were unveiled and they were still selling quite well, even with the Eta calibers on the inside. And I would still say great value for the money and where they were being positioned. But now they are a little bit more elevated in terms of price, but in the process of doing that, you are getting their manufactured caliber on the inside. I think it's a good compromise, variety of different dial colors to choose from and a watch that's really hard to beat for the money. I was debating whether or not this should be included on this list, but I decided that I think it can fit. This is the IWC Mark 20. The crown, as well as some of the Flieger styles in the design might create some issues for some. This is a versatile watch, no question, especially if you opt for the traditional black. Great contrast, much more wearable case compared to some of the previous Mark series watches with a 10.9 millimeter thickness and a lug to like a 49 millimeter. So a little bit longer, I would say these wear like a 40 and a half millimeter case, but still relatively quite wearable. While this is now getting 100 meters of water resistance, which is a great step forward and an IWC caliber, the 32111 with that five day power reserve. 
Now the question for Omega, and you could go many different ways with the most versatile Omega watch. Now, I would say the most versatile Omega watch, I mean, I'm wearing a Globemaster on my wrist right now, but I don't know if that's the most versatile. It's a versatile watch, uh, but I wouldn't give that the nod. Then you have the Aquaterra, which I would probably argue is the most versatile, but just for the sake of being a bit more complete in some complication types, I wanna give a mention to the Omega Speedmaster because this is one of the rare chronographs and probably one of the only chronographs on this list. And the reason for that is just how it's able to be worn in so many different environments. For me, the Speedmaster is probably the most versatile chronograph you're gonna have on the market or really close to it. With the simple black white contrast, it's never going to clash with anything. It looks great dressed down, dressed up. I don't think it would look crazy if you wore this with the suit. I mean, in my opinion, I think it looks pretty buttoned up in my opinion. The 42 millimeter case just wears like a dream on so many wrists. Like I was a little hesitant. When you see 42 millimeters, you're like, ah, I don't know if I can pull this one off. If you're you know, on the fence of liking like smaller watches. But when I wore this for the first time, I mean, it was just such an amazing, amazing experience. And with the draping of the new bracelet, which I'm a huge fan of, I think it even adds to the way the watch just has some charm and even maybe feels even more buttoned up compared to the former bracelet that we saw with the previous uh, generation. And again, I think if I had to pick the most versatile Omega watch, it would probably be the Aquaterra collection, but just for the entirety of this list and differentiating a bit more and allowing us to focus on maybe some of these highlights in the industry that are very versatile, I wanted to include the Speedmaster because it's one of the rare instances where a chronograph has this ability to just work in so many different scenarios. Now for the next watch here, we have the Cartier Santos de Cartier. If you look at the heritage in the original story behind the Santos with Alberto Santos Dumont, with this being a pilot watch and really a sports watch at its core at the beginning. And then it eventually started to shift into this more dress oriented approach. And now it comes together with the Santos de Cartier to be kind of a nice way of bridging these two gaps, in my opinion, and maybe among the best. It does definitely lean more dressy, but you're still getting 100 meters of water resistance, mechanical caliber on the inside, a couple different versions to choose from. You go for the standard option with the date, or you can go for the medium option. Great sizing adjustment for the bracelet. Now, in many cases, when you see exposed screws on a case, you might think, okay, this is a bit too industrial, might not work. Uh, but with the infusion of the Roman numerals and what is being presented throughout the rest of this watch, I think it absolutely works and makes one of the most versatile watches out there. Now, one of the best brands when it comes to this concept of meeting in the middle ground, of having so many options to choose from for a watch when you're talking about versatility has to be Grand Seiko. I would say a lot of their watches lean a tad more dressy compared to some of the other competition in the price range, but this allows them to have more of a unique sauce when you're talking about them stacking up. And the watch I'm gonna mention here, again, this is just one of so many that you can choose from, but I decided to go with this one because of the case. You're looking at a 62 GS case also infused with a dial pad pattern and a dial that with its color, I think will allow it to work in so many different environments. This is the SBGA 415. This is the winter addition to that Four Seasons collection. Uh, one of my favorites that they have in their entire lineup, 40 millimeter case, wearable lug to lug at 46.5 millimeters, made of titanium with a bracelet, 12.8 millimeters in thickness. So pretty thin in comparison to some of their other watches that sometimes do uh, fall victim to the thickness of their movements. Spring drive 9R65 on the inside with that accuracy standard of plus or minus one second per day. Sapphire crystal on top. I love also the bezel-less design of this and how the crystal just almost like floats up from that central case. It's lightweight and the dial color is incredibly complementary to pretty much anything that you would decide to wear with it. Now, the subject of Rolex was a tough one for me. I have two watches I'm going to include here. The one that I was difficult in pinpointing, I think you could mention three if you include the Submariner here, but I decided not to include the Submariner and I opted for two other watches that I find maybe a little bit more versatile. I think the first one people will agree with, maybe the second one they won't agree with as much, but I would argue that this is maybe the most versatile do-it-all watch uh, if you had a one watch collection in all of watches. And this is the Rolex Explorer. This watch establishes a framework that every other sports model from Rolex will work off of. If you look back in the history, this was really the start Look at those early Submariner references. You look at the early shift in the 1950s as they started to really expand out their sports collection. You look at the core identity of the Explorer in every single one of those designs. And now returning to 36 millimeters with the 124 270, 
it's, it's a watch that, yes, for some might be a little bit small, but it is as timeless as you're going to come by in watches. And with its black dial, with its contrasting markers and approach, it's simple, but I would describe this watch as the absolute epitome of purity when it comes to watch design. That Rolex, again, can really claim as their own. 3230 movement on the inside, 100 meters of water resistance, wearable lug to lug dimension, and a classic 36 millimeters, which again, some might find small, but this is classic Rolex Oyster Perpetual style case. A 70 hour plus power reserve. Again, it's a watch that if you were going to only spend money on one watch for the rest of your life, and you could wear it every single day and not have an issue, this probably could be the best in the entire industry. Now this next one is where it gets a bit more dicey because I could see people going both sides here. Uh, I think I'll mention both of them, but I'll mention the Rolex Datejust and then the Rolex Submariner. I think both of them are pillars. If you lean a little bit more casual, then you go for the Submariner. If you have the desire to wear something with more of a professional attire, I would go with the Datejust. They both have an element of being a little bit louder compared to some other options on this list, which is a point that I think you should mention if you're somebody that doesn't wanna draw attention to yourselves, that is going to maybe cause some challenges for different types of environments if you're that individual and you're only looking at one watch. But again, right behind the Explorer, I would say these are the next two in line. Explorer doesn't do anything for you, then you have these two different paths that you can go down. Datejust, I would go fluted bezel. Some might argue the more smooth bezel oyster bracelet is the way to go for the Datejust. To me, it's Jubilee and fluted bezel. Now that's probably making it less versatile, but I think it looks better in my opinion. And for the sub, uh, traditional sub, I would go traditional sub, uh, not the Submariner date, uh, just because I do feel like it just has this purity to its design, very similar to the Explorer. So now this next brand here, and how I was really thinking about this partially is, were there any brands I was not considering that sh maybe should be considered? You think of Breitling, top 10 brand in the Swiss watch industry in terms of sell-through, what is their most versatile watch? And I struggled to think about this, but then I just thought about it for a moment. It wasn't an obvious choice, but in my opinion, this is probably their most versatile watch and one of the most versatile chronographs on the entire market. That is the Breitling Premier B09. They recently unveiled a couple different dial colors within this family. And I would say the white dial version is probably the most versatile of any that we've seen so far. Now, I can't really make an argument about the pistachio green dial, but if you just change the dial color here and you look at the fundamental characteristics of how this dial is laid out, the symmetry of the register layout, the more dress oriented approach to the case as well as the dial, to me it's by far and away the most versatile watch Breitling makes uh, in my opinion, or at least very close to it. Uh, especially when you're considering chronographs, the B09 a little bit thinner compared to the B01. So you're getting case around 13 millimeters thick, lug to lug of 47.6 millimeters while still getting 100 meters of water resistance. And the Premier name actually predates that of the Navitimer. So it appeared in Breitling's history before that of the Navitimer, despite the Navitimer of course being the icon that it is. Now we have JLC and the JLC watch I'm going to consider here is going to be the Polaris Automatic. So this is the non-diving approach to the Polaris line in a watch that I think is incredibly underrated. There was a price increase on this watch, so it is making it maybe a slight bit more uh, in a range where there's a lot more to consider, but still a phenomenal watch for the money in my opinion. 41 millimeter case, though this is the like dual crown design, so you have more of that everyday approach with the Polaris collection, not the Polaris date options and the Memovox, which is going to be more towards that aquatic environment and approach there. 11.1 millimeters in thickness, 47.2 millimeters for that lug to lug, while still getting water resistance that's suitable and the 898E caliber on the inside. So now to conclude, I have two integrated steel sports watches. I was struggling here with what ones to include and where to draw the line. Now, this was my thought process. What integrated steel sports watches feel the most versatile and what are some of the characteristics that maybe make a integrated steel sports watch less versatile or maybe not as viable if you're talking about the two extremes? To me, when looking at things like the Royal Oak, the Vacheron Overseas, uh, the GP Laureato, which all very versatile watches. And again, I could argue, and for certain people out there, I could argue maybe is going to be more versatile for you, but I found that these two watches that I included here to be probably a nice middle ground uh, given a couple characteristics. Uh, we have the Chopard Alpine Eagle and then the 5712 from Patek Philippe. The reason I decided to include these two models is just how the bracelet looks. Uh, it's not as imposing. If you look at the Royal Oak integrated bracelet, 
all of the faceting and how the watch looks with the screws. It's a bit more imposing compared to some other watches that you might find out there. Now the Alpine Eagle still has some of these characteristics, but I find the bracelet finishing a bit more subdued, the case finishing a bit more subdued and not as loud compared to like the overseas and the Royal Oak. Not to say those watches are bad by any means. It's not what I'm trying to say. I'm just saying that if you're talking about trying to create something as viable as possible. I think the Chopard Alpine Eagle, probably you could argue is more versatile. Now that it's a better watch, I think that's a conversation you can absolutely have separately. Uh, Alpine Eagle, 100 meters of water resistance, 41 millimeter case, uh, getting some different dial colors to choose from, 9.9 .9 millimeters in thickness, which is also quite nice. And the movement on the inside, this is the 01.01C, beautiful caliber, Chopard in terms of their calibers across the board, producing some of the best movements and points of value when it comes to high level finish movements. If you look at their LUC models and uh, what's going on there, I would say pretty severely underappreciated brand across the board. And then you have the Patek Philippe Nautilus 5712. Now this is a watch that I wanted to include just because the Nautilus, because it's more rounded in the links, it's not as flashy in my opinion. Now, is the watch itself flashy because of how people affiliate this watch with all the baggage of uh, allocation and what's going on there? Potentially, it is more of a statement piece in that regard, but the 5712 has that combination of being a little bit more subdued and also getting that romantic factor that comes with the moon phase. In my mind, this feels like the less hype version, although of course very much in demand, but I find this to be one of the more versatile watches. Whenever I see a Nautilus on somebody's wrist at like a watch event or out and about, uh, which is not that often, but when you do see it, it looks really damn good. I'm not saying that like a Royal Oak, an Odysseus, or some of these other integrated steel sports watches look bad with a suit, but there's something about a Nautilus to me that just pairs a bit better in that environment while still not looking out of place when it comes to the more dressed down attire. And the other great thing about like this Nautilus and some other Nautiluses out there is they do tend to wear a bit thinner than other integrated steel sports watches and I find wear a bit more flat on the wrist so they slide underneath the dress cuff a bit more. But all right guys, that's my video here today looking at some of the most versatile watches on the entire market. I know this is a hard line to draw. Some people are gonna disagree with me and that's okay, I totally understand. Uh, their versatility for you is different than it is for another person. I'm just trying to think about all the extremes, all people out there and what would maybe work for them. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe and hit the bell icon. Also, if there was a watch that you felt was overlooked, leave a comment down below. Love to see what you guys have to say. And then also I think for others that are maybe shopping for this concept and idea, they can go see what other people would recommend as well. Also, definitely check out teddybaldestar.com, full authorized dealer of 30 brands, quick and fast fulfillment, dedicated customer support, and a full factory warranty for all the products that we offer. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I will see you all very soon.